Welcome to worship. After the storms passed through our area last week, I've continued to think about those disciples on the boat after Jesus has come to them and stilled the waters and what that next morning must have felt like. And after the storm, when the anxiety has finally passed away and and the adrenaline has already passed by, there's this feeling of peace, calmness. So those disciples arrived on the other side of the lake, the still waters, and the gentle waves lapping at the coast. I imagine, with many other feelings, there must have been a feeling of peace, too. The image of the lake shore is one that I love. The water has always been a main part of my life in growing up by the coast. But the calmness of the lake shore reminds me of the calmness and peace I find in my relationship with God, too. The slow in and out of the water. Now, these times of peace, I've felt them throughout my life and throughout my relationship with God. It's, it's in the familiar like songs and, and parts of liturgy. It's found in prayer and in meditation. It's in things like reciting the Lord's Prayer, and the Apostles' Creed, hearing familiar texts, and even in reciting the confession and hearing words of forgiveness. As we've begun our weeks of prayer on Wednesday nights, we've started with these words of confession that I grew up with in my church, as many others did as well. These old words, being captive to sin, cannot free ourselves. And even though it is confession, it reminds me of this familiar place in which I know God and God's unconditional love. And it's a way that we're going to start our worship today, too. And remembering the peace and the knowledge that God's love surpasses all other things. And as we bring forward confession, what we are doing is strengthening our relationship with the God who already loves us no matter what. So hear these words. Join with the whole body as we bring forward our confession. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear these words of mercy. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Will you pray with me? God of all peoples, your arms reach out to embrace all those who call upon you. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy your name may be known throughout the earth through Jesus Christ, 
our Savior and Lord. Amen. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. And everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of the Savior, the hope of nations. Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Take me as you find me, all my fears and failures, and fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the world see. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave the holy gospel according to matthew jesus left that place and went away to the district of tyre and sidon just then a canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus didn't answer her. His disciples came out and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. And, and Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the woman came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is God's word of life for us. Amen. In today's text, we have a Canaanite woman asking Jesus for help. Jesus' disciples not interested in helping her, and Jesus seeming less than gracious than I truly believe him to be. It's a puzzling exchange. This woman, not a follower of Christ, one who has only heard rumors of Jesus' power, believes in him so much that she's willing to beg for his help for her daughter. And Jesus says nothing until after his disciples tell him to send her away, and then what he does say is unsettling at best. Many read this text 
and believe it to be a test. But I wonder, a test of whom? The Canaanite woman? Someone labeled in ancient terms as someone so foreign to Jesus and his disciples and she to them, even considered a foe from long ago, but yet one who calls Jesus Lord, begs him to help her because she believes he can and then kneels at his feet. Or the disciples, Jesus' followers, those who have seen grace upon grace and power beyond compare, those who have recently witnessed Jesus feed multitudes with only five loaves of bread and two fish. They watched him walk on water, heal the sick, cast out demons and more, but also those who speak before Jesus can, urging him to send this woman away for she's bothering them with her impassioned appeal for mercy. Yes, I wonder just who Jesus is testing with his uncharacteristic words. For sure it's complicated. But I'm not so sure that Jesus' aim is to deny the Canaanite woman mercy to test her faith more than she has already displayed in simply approaching him in the first place. Or if his goal is more a dialogue for the benefit of his disciples who are listening those who urged Jesus to send the woman away without helping her. Because immediately before coming to this region of Tyre and Sidon, Jesus had been in the land of Gennesaret, a region of Galilee where he healed and helped crowds and crowds of people with his disciples. Some people were brought to him. Others simply came on their own accord to Jesus with the hope of simply touching his garments to be made whole, and, and they were. They were made well by Jesus. Upon hearing what was happening, a group of scribes and Pharisees from the temple in Jerusalem came, but not for the reason to rejoice with Jesus and the disciples for all that had been helped, but rather they came wondering why Jesus and his followers were not following cleanliness laws and how they prepared to eat, what they ate, and with whom they ate. It's insecure leadership at its best. But in the conversation, we hear Jesus' comment that defilement comes from what comes out of the mouth or what one says that originates in the heart and not from what goes in the mouth or what one eats or drinks. In other words, Jesus tried to point these religious leaders to the greater things, that their words were powerful and important. So as we encounter today's text, on the heels of all that Jesus had done for so many in so many ways in the wake of this conversation with the Pharisees and the scribes about the power of words. And now in this new foreign region, it's disappointing that, that the disciples say to Jesus before he says a word, send her away. It's the second time in recent weeks that the disciples have told Jesus to send people away rather than help them. A few weeks ago, we heard the story that after ministering to a crowd of people all day and as dinner time approached, the disciples told Jesus to send the people away so that they might be able to go and get something to eat, to which Jesus responded that the disciples should feed the people. And, and then Jesus continued by taking five loaves of bread and two fish and feeding over 5,000 people from it. And of course, we might understand the disciples' statement. It was rational, a justifiable thing to do to tell Jesus to send the people off to go get their own supper. However, aside from the disciples probably misunderstanding the resources of the crowd, if Jesus had listened to their perfectly logical reason for sending the people away, they would have missed not only witnessing, but being part of one of the greatest miracles of Jesus' life, feeding so many people with so little. So even more, it's remarkable that after such an extraordinary experience as the feeding of the 5,000, hearing Jesus' statement to the scribes and the Pharisees that what comes out of the mouth or words have the power to defile more than unclean foods as prescribed by the law and everything else that they have witnessed, everything that they've been party to, 
Still, still, the disciples default to the statement, send her away. Why didn't they urge Jesus to heal the woman's daughter? In the end, Jesus offers God's abundance and healing to the woman and her daughter. The frustration or annoyance of the disciples doesn't stop him. Thanks be to God. The words of the Canaanite woman, Lord, have mercy. They keep coming back to me as words I, too, have uttered over and over again in the last few months. This simple prayer is one I continue to pray, as I know so many of you have prayed as well. Lord, have mercy. Have mercy upon this world, upon this church, upon our community, upon us. And in response, I pray none of us has heard the words of annoyance as the disciples voiced, but Jesus' pronouncement of the greatness of faith over us. The Canaanite woman reminds us of what steadfast faith in Jesus the Christ looks like. It is as persistent as it is compassionate as she advocates for her little daughter, someone not necessarily valued in the world, someone not able to ask for help for herself. And as she kneels before Jesus, her faith is shown as full of humility and grace. It's a beacon of hope for all of us to see. May the Canaanites prayer, her faith, her, her, her example, inspire you this week. Lord, have mercy. Thanks be to God. Amen.